Hello, and welcome to the 39th Annual Parker Lecture Awards and Ceremony. My name is Brian Lapis. I've served on the board of the United Church of Christ Media Justice Ministry for more than 20 years. And on behalf of the board of directors, I welcome you to this year's proceedings. We are so pleased to be on AirMeet, where we can use a virtual opportunity to talk with each other. Please check out the chat feature, join tables of other guests who you would like to talk to, and enjoy the UCC's well-known extravagant welcome. And on social media, we invite you to use the hashtag Parker Lecture 2021. The Parker Lecture is a tribute to our ministry's founder, Reverend Dr. Everett Parker. Dr. Parker worked in his time to ensure the technology of that day served all people. And we are so privileged to share the stories and work of three people this morning who are doing the same thing today in our time. This event not only commemorates the work of Reverend Parker and OC Inc. and our honorees, but it is also our annual fundraiser to support the work that continues to this day. Thank you so much to those of you who have made a financial contribution. And don't worry, it's not too late. There should be a link in the chat if you want to donate right now to support OC Inc. Also, some of you with eagle eyes may notice something different about our logo. Cheryl will be up in a minute to tell you more about it. To begin our event today, here is Reverend Freeman Palmer, Conference Minister for the United Church of Christ Central Atlantic Conference, who will offer an invocation. Good afternoon. I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the blessing of this moment in time and in eternity. When we pause to be informed and inspired, by those whose words and work will invoke in this space the spirit of Everett Parker. It was Everett Parker's mission to ensure in the powerful and influential communication of media that all voices are heard. And for that, God, we thank you. God, may our time together in all ways possible serve to honor Everett Parker's advocacy, faithful life, and prolific witness, and remind us of the importance of the continuation of his work and legacy. God, we pray both your presence and your blessing upon this time. May we not only be informed and inspired, but infused with a thirst for fairness inclusion and justice, and work to realize Everett Parker's vision that we might see the day when all people, with neither exception nor exclusion, have both the opportunity to speak and be heard as far and wide as their voices can carry them. May this all be so in this time, our time, together as we pray this in your many names by which you are known, amen. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Reverend Palmer, for that lovely and inspiring invocation. We are so pleased that you all are here today at the 39th Annual Parker Lecture and Awards Ceremony. We're all here online together on AirMeet, and I hope you're able to use the features to connect with each other and chat a little bit while we have our program. And we are thrilled that this means that we can have people from all over the country joining with us today. We hope that next year we could finally meet in person again, but we also plan to have these regular online gatherings as part of the Parker Lecture in the future to bring everybody together. So... As Brian said at the top of the event, we have exciting news we're unveiling today. I am really thrilled to tell you that our longstanding ministry is getting a new name and a new logo. Although for many years we have been called the Office of Communication, Inc., we have also been known as the United Church of Christ's Media Justice Ministry, and the board voted earlier this year to select that as our formal new name. And to go with our new name is a new logo. As you can see, the new logo includes waves. They could be a radio transmission or a Wi-Fi signal. And at the bottom is a graphic that could either be a speech bubble or a comma. As a speech bubble, it shows that our voices and the voices of others are going out into the world, bringing justice to it. 
for those who know the UCC, a comma is also the symbol that many in our denomination have chosen to signify our favorite tagline, God is still speaking, which means that new interpretations of justice speak to us today, just as to our ancestors long ago. You will see our new logo and later this year, a new website as we roll out the new imagery and our new tagline, Faithful Advocacy for Communications Rights. We are very pleased and I hope you will like it also. So let's turn to our main event. We are here to honor Reverend Parker's legacy and our amazing honorees. But as you know, the event is also a fundraiser without which our work could not continue. On behalf of all of us at UCC Media Justice, I thank every individual who has chipped in for a ticket or donation. Please know it's not too late. You should see a link in the chat if you would like to contribute now. Every contribution does make a difference. At this time, I also want to extend huge gratitude to our sponsors for their financial support. These companies and organizations and their staffs are engaged in serious dialogue with us. Sometimes we disagree heartily. And other times we find common cause in our goals and solutions. Nonetheless, by remaining in partnership, we hope that we can bring a stronger, more equitable, and more digitally connected future to everyone. So thank you to our lead sponsor, Facebook. To our patrons, Charter Communications, Comcast NBC Universal, T-Mobile, and the United Church of Christ. And we also thank our nonprofit and corporate special friends. Verizon, Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, Best Best in Krieger, Kelly Dry and Warren, and TrackPhone. We really appreciate your partnership and your financial support. Now, I am so proud and excited to introduce the Reverend John Dorhauer, our denomination's national leader, general minister and president, John Dorhauer. John? Thank you so much, Cheryl, and congratulations on the new name and logo. I am sure it will serve you very well. I'm delighted to be back with you, even if but virtually. The last time I was able to join a Parker lecture was at the very beginning of my term back in 2015. And I'm really happy to be here again because quite frankly, Everett Parker is one of my personal heroes. I'm also here because I enjoy the opportunity to brag a little bit about the great work that the United Church of Christ's Media Justice Ministry has done in the last year. Our whole denomination is at work in bringing justice into reality. And as the denomination's leader, it's a joy to share with the world the work of our affiliated ministries. In the last year, UCC Media Justice has played a critical role in partnership with many of you here in persuading Congress to adopt a federal emergency broadband benefit, $50 each month for low-income families to help purchase broadband. That's pretty incredible. Not only was the church in the halls of Congress, we also played a key role in the major Supreme Court cases, one of the major Supreme Court cases this year. Well, ultimately, the court disappointingly permitted the FCC to relax its ownership rules, we were also very pleased that the court preserved the government's core role to implement the law's public interest standard to promote diversity, which really was at the heart of Dr. Parker's work. Not only that, but the United Church Christ Media Justice continued its membership in the Change the Terms Coalition, working for accountability for social media platforms that sometimes look the other way as hate, and vitriol endanger people's lives. Just a few weeks ago, Cheryl testified before Congress, promoting the importance of ending predatory rates for family members, clergy and loved ones who communicate with incarcerated people by telephone or by video connections. These rates are driving people into debt in a broken marketplace, and it's got to end. The United Church of Christ is a leader in many aspects of justice advocacy. Our church is and has long been a prophetic church, seeking to bring the ideals of justice and inclusion that we believe so firmly in and that we believe God wishes to see here on earth in our time. 
Part of that work is lifting up those who are doing that work now. Our honorees are creating their own road by walking, by putting one foot in front of the other and connecting more voices and more families to the benefits of technology. And through that technology, people are more connected to each other, maybe to their friends and family members, or maybe to a person they've never met, whether that person is on the other side of town, the other side of the country, or in a land far across the ocean. The power of this technology is magical. It's transformative. And if we stick to our ethical guideposts in using it and creating the world benefits. And now, we turn to honoring those people who are champions of the very ethical guideposts that ground us. It is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the United Church of Christ Media Justice Ministry, the Honorable Earl Williams Jr., who will present our first honoree. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Dorar. Greetings to everyone joining us from across the country. My name is Earl Williams, and I'm chair of the United Church of Christ Media Justice Ministries Board of Directors. Wow, does it feel good to use our new name. I've served on the board for many years now, but in addition to my role with the UCC, I also serve on the City Council in Shaker Heights, Ohio. So I know a thing or two about bringing broadband to everyone in a community through local government, and this is why it brings me such great pleasure to introduce Francella Ocello. Francella currently serves as the executive director of Next Century Cities, an organization which supports mayors and community leaders across the country as they seek to ensure that everyone has fast, affordable, and reliable internet access. Francella joined Next Century Cities in July 2019 and in a short time has made an incredible impact. For example, in May, NCC released a major broadband mapping report which addresses the failure of federal data to accurately capture who has broadband and who does not. And this year, Francella was chosen as a technology and public purpose fellow at Harvard's Welfare Center for Science and International Affairs. Francella is everywhere, whether she's offering keynotes at a wide range of conferences, testifying before Congress, meeting with state regulators, or briefing the local government leaders who are in NCC's membership, you can always count on her to be perfectly poised, scrupulously accurate, and engaging and ready to go. One of the major reasons for her receipt of the Donald H. McGannon Award is that Francella has led Next Century Cities into putting digital inclusion, justice, and equity at the center of its work. Broadband inclusion efforts must include the whole community. This is the same ethos that led Everett Parker to make sure television in its day served the whole community across racial, and economic divides. Francella is helping cities across the country to do the same thing. One of Donald McGannon's more famous quotes is leadership is action, not position. And no one fulfills that more than Francella Ochillo. So I'm proud to present her with the Donald H. McGannon Award. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Williams. And I actually, um... I had so many thoughts in my mind about what I was supposed to do today, and I always feel like I have to um, follow wherever um, the moment leads me. And the first thing that I want to say is, um, number one, uh, we're big fans of what's happening in Shaker Heights. <laughs> and so, um, and we will always uh, go to bat for local officials and bring them into the rooms that uh, sometimes they're just not invited. And so, um, and I really appreciate just being able to appreciate this time and space um, not only uh, with this organization, with UCC, that has a long legacy of fighting for justice and equity, but uh, just to be able to share the stage um, with so many people that are recognized today, as well as people who aren't um, able to be celebrated today, but that we celebrate their work all the time. Uh, I want to say specific thanks to UCC, um, Cheryl Lianza, and Colette Fozard, and everybody on the committee that helps bring um, this type of production to life because there's a lot of work that happens um, thanklessly in the background that makes a world of difference. And I also wanna say congratulations to Angela Sieper and Eric Ward, uh, not only for their work personally, but also for their organizations and really setting uh, benchmarks for excellence in advocacy. Um, and as we're thinking about the work um, of NCC, 
I think that, you know, when I look back on my story at NCC, uh, what we are, where we've been, where we're going, um, none of that would be possible without my staff. Um, Lucas, Ryan, um, Corianne, Brittany Ray, and other uh, part-time people who have been uh, to support our work in the background. Uh, every single time I ask them to do things that seem impossible, they just ask when and they come with me and none of that ever goes unnoticed. Um, and finally, I do wanna just uh, carve out a, a moment just to say thank you um, to the people on my cheer squad. Some of them were able to join uh, the ceremony today. I am forever grateful for their support because the, the past two years in particular, like for everyone, um, have been both challenging and transformational. And at first I was just so thankful uh, for being able to get through it, but more so I am incredibly thankful for them reminding me that this is only the beginning. Turning to um, specifically this award, um, I think about a lot of time lately, I spend time explaining to people what is the digital divide, uh, the urgency of the digital divide, uh, both from a tech policy and an economic perspective. And for people who have no relation to tech policy, they tend to associate digital divide issues with a, a phenomenon associated with COVID. It's this thing they saw in parking lots, they read it in newspapers, they have no personal relationship with it. Very often they'll ask me, well, why can't we just solve this problem with government funding um, and, and holistically see this as someone else's fight? And in my view, it means that in those moments, we can either shrink and um, concede space that this isn't urgent, or we can decide how we want to be recorded in history. And I will always choose the latter. I think a lot about how are we going to be the generation that delivers on the promise that all people are valued and welcomed and should have the ability to contribute to a digital society. Otherwise, we are simply elevating systems and constructs that never believed in that promise. To illustrate, I just wanna share three quick points, uh, really thinking about the story of now, how I fit into that story and the story of us. And when I think about the story of now, a lot of the times, even when we're trying to explain this work, even though it's a really exciting time to work on tech and tech policy issues, and my work specifically focuses on um, broadband access, increasing adoption, and also making sure that digital equity is a central tenet of universal um, access strategies. I think that my most important work is really trying to help people understand how access and adoption are related to digital citizenship. And that's a larger concept that goes beyond being able to just get people online, but really talking about, are we enabling them to benefit from those, those connections and to actually be positioned to contribute to a digital ecosystem? The statistics about who is being left behind, who is being cut out of those opportunities are telling. And these are the same populations that have been fighting for economic opportunity, health equity, and equal rights for generations. How do I fit into that story? Uh, just as a personal note, I think sometimes just to make this human for people, very often when I walk into a room um, or I give a speech, inevitably in the recap, people will describe it as, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what I actually said out loud. They'll describe it as, Francella is a great advocate for people of color. Sometimes I'll even, even recently, two weeks ago, I was in a meeting they asked for perspectives um, from marginalized communities. And in a really awkward, tense silence, everyone on camera froze and they just turned to me. And they were hoping that I would interject in the, the, the awkward silence. And I remind people that, you know, that is not unique to me. There are a lot of my colleagues of various shades who share that experience, who have that same testimony. And I say to you that we don't only dream in color. We have lots of extraordinary ideas to advance the human condition, not just people who look like us. And finally, I wanna point out the story of us. When I think about the McGannon Award to advance corporate, or McGannon's work really, to advance corporate responsibility in the media, I think about the fact that he was working on a system that didn't believe that every person deserved a platform. Media ownership was homogenous and exclusive by design. 
It wasn't that the system wasn't working. It was working exactly as it was designed. But we don't have to repeat that same story in tech or tech policy. Working to ensure that every single person has access to digital citizenship requires us dismantling ideas and outdated values that are embedded in our public policy. We have to be willing to confront how some of those biases manifests itself in our own organizations. And while we are demanding change from government agencies and even corporations, nonprofits, think tanks, academic institutions, we must also be willing to change. We have to be willing to make space for new people and new voices because we're in this together. We need to see old problems in new ways. We need to find a way to share the mic we need to make room at the table for people who look different than we do, the people that we call the others. So while I am honored and so incredibly grateful, not only for this award and all of the, the bits and pieces, the bruises, the wins that got me here today, I hope that in the final analysis, um, that those are the things that people will remember about my work. So on behalf of not only um, next century cities, but um, all of the advocates who don't always get a platform or the shine that they deserve. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. We are in this together and I appreciate this um, opportunity. Hello from the West Coast and good morning to others who like me are still in the early part of the day as we join together. My name is Reverend Mike Denton. I am the conference minister of the Pacific Northwest Conference of the United Church of Christ based in Seattle, Washington. I am so thrilled to be here introducing our Parker Award recipient, Angela Seifer. Angela founded the National Digital Inclusion Alliance in 2015 and currently serves as its exec executive director. The Alliance is a community of digital inclusion practitioners and advocates, bringing together more than 600 affiliate organizations. NDIA is one of those organizations that, after it came into being, was hard to imagine the world without. How could it have been that before Angela's vision, there was no national organization dedicated solely to sharing best practices and tools among organizations nationwide, working on the ground to bring all communities to full and rich use of digital technology? In the world of COVID-19, our country's ability to respond to the need of getting millions of more people online would have been significantly worse without NDIA. The sheer number of increasing members of NDIA tells the story. When one of NDIA's amazing staff members joined us at the UCC's national meeting in a workshop this summer, their total number of affiliates stood in the mid 500s. By this month, only a few months later, the number has jumped to more than 600. Angela and her team have been in high demand, helping local community organizations stand up technology outreach, sharing data and best practices, then turning around and synthesizing that information for policymakers in Washington, DC. Angela is no stranger to this work. Starting in Toledo, Ohio in 1996 as a graduate student, coordinating a regional community technology network. Angela combines on the ground experience, for example, in running the Ohio Community Computing Network, as well as modeling and research and projects like the one she conducted for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Angela has been critical in focusing on the proper definitions for concepts that many of us casually refer to as the digital divide. Angela knows that to solve a problem, you must be able to precisely define it. Thus, NDIA explains that digital inclusion refers to the activities necessary to ensure that all individuals and communities, including the most disadvantaged, have access to and use of information and techno communication technologies. And digital equity is the condition when we have reached those goals, when all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy. Angela's career has been dedicated to using digital inclusion to reach digital equity before many of us even knew what those terms meant. We are grateful for her willingness and ability to lead the way, to show us where we need to go and how to get there. For that reason, I am honored to present Angela with the Parker Award. Thank you, Reverend. 
Uh, so I have my award. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, UCUC Media Justice. I'm truly honored to receive this award. I'm honored to be your partner. Congratulations to Francella. I'm honored to be in this virtual room with her. I brought a prop. Can you all see what that is? Uh, so the NDIA team gave me this at our virtual retreat in August because the NDIA is a unicorn. So we talk about ourselves like that. Uh, we are unique. There's no other organization like this, like us. Uh, we are unique because we represent those 600 community-based digital inclusion programs around the country. And the NDIA team, we learn from this community, we help them learn from each other, and we use those learnings to educate policymakers, the media, the general public. That's our uniqueness, that whole thing all wrapped together. Uh, so seven years ago when we started NDIA, I had zero public policy experience, zero advocacy experience. Uh, I knew digital inclusion, but one could say I didn't really know what I was doing <laughs> when it came to the policy side. Uh, what I did have was a network of digital inclusion practitioners and advocates and a passion for elevating on the ground digital inclusion work. And I really had this moment where I was like, if I don't do this, when does it happen? Uh, what I also had at the time was a group of folks who were willing to be on a board of directors of an organization with no funding. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing, right? Uh, Laura Breeden, the Laura Breeden said, I'm in. Bill Callahan was willing to work for free. Like that's, that's how NDIA got started. John Windhausen and Amina Fazlula took me into meetings at the FCC, because remember, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, so I get into these meetings at the FCC, and I'm stunned to find a dozen people around a table waiting to discuss the realities of local digital inclusion programs. They wanted to know what was happening on the ground. I remember Jay Schwartz showed me some notes he had written on NDIA Lifeline comments. So first we had figured out how to submit comments because lots of folks helped us. I get into this room and one of the folks there who's you know, now with Comcast looks at him and he shows me. Like, and, and to realize that somebody had taken what we had written and was taking it seriously, that was astounding. Gigi Stone asked really pointed questions. It wasn't fluff. Right. She made me feel as if I belonged in that room. And then on that flight back to Columbus, I sat on the airplane and I had this feeling of pressure on my shoulders. Such that I really felt I was going to fall to my knees. That pressure was the weight of what we were trying to do. And I could feel it. Wanda Davis created the Ashbury Senior Community Computing Center in Cleveland 20 years ago. And I've known Wanda about, about that long. She saw the digital inequities in her neighborhood. She paid staff when she could. They volunteered when she could not. My job, the reason I felt that pressure, was that I needed policymakers in DC to know Wanda's struggles and for them to appreciate her expertise, both. Two weeks ago, Wanda and I had a chat with acting chair Rosenworcel on Instagram Live. Wanda was heard. That is success. NDIA is in the midst of crafting a strategic plan right now. We're discussing things like measurable outcomes. My measures of success are sometimes the obvious. 2.75 billion with a B <laughs> and the Digital Equity Act. But they're also when Lazone Grays in Topeka tells me he convinced the state of Canvas that his organization should become a vendor to provide computers, connectivity, and training to individuals receiving SNAP benefits. That is success. This is digital equities moment. I will not look back at this time and wish I had done more, been more strategic, taken more risks. I will not. At the NDIA team retreat, I was reminded the pressure is distributed now. NDIA is now a team of 12, and I'm happy to report everyone gets paid a fair living wage. So thank you to UCC Media Justice. I love your new name. Uh, thank you for having me here. Greetings to you all, wherever this may find you. My name is Steven Renderos, and I'm the Executive Director of Media Justice. We're a national movement building hub uh, fighting for racial, economic, and gender justice in a digital age. 
I'm grateful to the United Church of Christ Media Justice Ministry for inviting me to introduce your keynote speaker for this year's Everett C. Parker Lecture, Eric K. Ward. Eric is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. He is the recipient of the 2021 Civil Courage Prize, the first time in the award's history that an American has won the prize, revealing the dangerous proliferation of hate crimes and political violence by authoritarian and extremist movements in the United States. Eric brings over three decades of leadership in community organizing and philanthropy to his role as Western States Network's uh, executive director and senior fellow with, with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward. Since Eric took the helm in 2017, Western States Center has become a national hub for innovative responses to white nationalism, anti-Semitism, and structural inequality towards a world where everyone can live, love, work, and worship free from bigotry and fear. One of the aspects of Eric's work that I'm a particular fan of is Western States Network's Inclusive Democracy Cultural Lab, where Eric engages artists and musicians as critical change makers. Eric is originally from my hometown, Los Angeles, and began his civil rights work when the white nationalist movement was engaged in violent paramilitary activity that sought to undermine democratic governance in the Pacific Northwest. I can go on and on about all the things this brilliant person has accomplished, and I still wouldn't do justice to his importance as a critical leader in building the inclusive democracy all of us deserve. Over the past year, as our world descended into a dark period, defined by a pandemic of COVID and white nationalism that both were killing our people first, it was Eric's words that I turned to the most. Recently, he wrote, it's too easy Intense moments like these, moments of fighting monsters to become monsters ourselves. Eric is a leader who reminds us that the best antidote to hate is love. He has an ability to see humanity in all of us. It inspires me, and I'm so grateful you get to hear from him. Now, the best thing I can do is get out of the way and let you hear from him first. Please welcome Eric K. Ward. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you everyone for being with us today. It has been uh, a long four years, but as my father reminds me, who, who turned 96 last week, it has been a long 96 years uh, in America. The arc of justice is often slow moving, and the urgency to come and ally, to lift up the opportunities and the future, right, of those who are most impacted by inequality weighs heavy on our shoulders in this moment. The Reverend Everett Parker understood this, and, and so too do our honorees today, Francella and Angela. I congratulate you, but I also thank you for your work and the sacrifices that you have made to do that work, the sacrifices that aren't part of the stories that are told each and every day. I also thank you for each and every day lifting up those who you represent and who are reflections of your work each and every day. But I embrace you for your courage to dream of a future world where everyone can live, love, worship, and work free from fear. That is really the essence of Reverend Parker. He understood some fundamental pieces, which I will get to soon. My name is Eric Ward, as Stephen said, Executive Director of Western State Center. Western State Center, based out of Portland, Oregon, works to advance a mission that expands inclusive democracy. By inclusive democracy, we simply mean a system of government that centers people, that is transparent, and accountable, that we understand that democracy is the most radical of experiments, the idea that we, the people, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, religion, can come together without dictators, without royalty, without corporate bosses, to decide our destinies, to figure out our challenges, 
and to move a society forward together, grounded in opportunity and equity. That work has been struggled over for decades in this country, and we still have far to go. But it's important that we don't become the Eeyores of social movements, meaning it is always important to take a moment to recognize the things that have been done and to dream of the things that will be done. It's hard to do so in this moment. I often find myself taking deep breaths over these last four years as we have watched violence, the intimidation, the exploitation, and the othering of ourselves and our neighbors. As those have manipulated and utilized social media platforms to drive division and to organize bigotry, and for those large businesses to put their profits over the cohesion and peacefulness of a society. Indeed, in these moments, it can seem awful dark. We all witnessed the events of January 6th in Washington, D.C., where attempted insurrection injured over 140 law enforcement officers. We watched as elected officials, our highest elected officials, huddled in protection in small rooms, as a mob rage seeking to overturn democracy in America. Since 2015, right-wing extremists have been involved in 267 plots or attacks and 91 fatalities between 2015 and the insurrection. What is most concerning is that the number of domestic terror plots and attacks are at the highest they have been in decades. But we need to be clear, the insurrection on January 6th did not end that day in Washington, D.C. That insurrection continues in cities and counties around the country. Health workers, educators, school board members, a local elected officials find themselves being threatened, facing physical attacks and disruptions each and every day. It can seem almost insurmountable in this moment. How do we understand what is occurring around us and how do we begin to move forward? I believe that we first have to understand and address three of our own myths around how we understand this social movement. We should be clear first before we get to this myth that we are dealing with two phenomena in our society right now that call for our immediate attention. The first is the vestiges and legacy of white supremacy, a system that was created to organize society in North America. It was a system that was built off the exploitation of African people the stolen resources and thefts of native lands and their lives. And the third, not often discussed or addressed, the exploitation and the con social control of women, misogyny. It was slavery, chattel slavery. It was misogyny. And the treatment and stolen resources of native people that allowed this society to construct in ideology called white supremacy. The belief that some people are superior and others are inferior on nothing more than the color of a person's skin. We should understand that this was not a value neutral summation, that thousands were killed and exploited and injured from the system. White supremacy was successfully confronted in the 1960s by a 1960 civil rights movement. This 1960 civil rights movement challenged white supremacy as the rule of law and overthrew it. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not here today to say that white supremacy no longer exists. It certainly exists in culture. It certainly exists in behavior and economics each and every day. What I'm here to address is that that 1960 civil rights movement successfully challenged white supremacy 
as the only lens upon which we could understand our society. But look, no good deed goes unpunished. And at the peak of the civil rights movement, a backlash began to form. January in Washington, D.C. in 2021 actually began as a backlash against the civil rights movement in the late 1960s. Imagine for a second, you are someone who believes in white superiority in Jim Crow. You haven't been convinced of it. You've simply been socialized to see the world that way. Each and every day, it is the air you breathe. And all of a sudden, you wake up one morning to realize you suffered the biggest political defeat of white supremacy. How do you explain it? Do you all of a sudden just say, well, I guess black people weren't as inferior as, as we thought? No, people don't change their minds so quickly. So they constructed an answer similar to how I did when I would do poorly on tests in schools. I always had a reason, never involved, not studying hard enough or not checking in with an instructor. Instead, I began to construct myths around why I, I failed. So too did those committed to separate but equal. They were never going to admit that they lost to black growing political and moral power in this country. To do so would be to admit, right, the fallacies of white supremacy and the false belief of racial superiority. So they constructed a new argument. And this is the first piece that we have to understand in this moment. Whether we are talking about systemic racism or the rise of a white nationalist social movement, both of these moments that we face in our society are grounded upon the lens of race. If white supremacy, the system of exploitation and discrimination, is written upon the paper of racism targeting black and indigenous communities, the rise of white nationalism is written upon the paper of anti-Semitism the hatred of Jews, the belief that there is a Jewish conspiracy to destroy white America. When we heard Nazis marching on the streets of Charlottesville saying Jews will not replace us, they were pulling from this old belief constructed in the 60s. Look, anti-Semitism isn't just at the core of white nationalism. It is the core of white nationalism. It is so central to white nationalism that I believe as a black person that I, my community, and other marginalized groups will never win our freedom if we're not also active in the struggle to uproot anti-Jewish hate. Let me explain. As I said, amongst 21st century white nationalists, Jews are cast in the same role they have always filled for anti-Semites as the absolute other demons stirring a pot of lesser evils and the driving force behind white dispossession. At the foundation of the modern day movement is an explicit claim that Jews are a separate race. You see, for white nationals, their anti-Jewish hatred is also a form of racism. They claim that the position of Jews as white in American society is the greatest trick the devil has ever played. They place Jews as an enemy race that must be exposed and eliminated. It is that fantasy of invisible Jewish power that explains for white nationalists how black Americans, a race of supposed inferiors, could orchestrate the end of Jim Crow, but also how feminists and the LGBTQ community could upend traditional gender roles and how immigrant workers can mount successful challenges to economic inequality. Folks often ask me, where is the anti-Semitism in the room? It's everywhere. When the Tree of Life shooter said Jews were committing a genocide, he was taking on and using language that was ultimately familiar, intimately familiar to his fellow white nationalists. Each and every day, it is not just the Jewish community, but non-Jews who pay the price of this unchallenged anti-Semitism. We remember 
the white nationalists who targeted black worshipers in Charlotte, South Carolina, or Latinos who were targeted in a Walmart, or Sikh worshipers in Wisconsin. While we understand the anti-black racism, the anti-immigrant and anti-Latino racism, and the Islamophobia that respectfully drove those murders, we are less aware that in each case, the killer believed that he was targeting those communities of color because they were waging an existential war against the Jewish community. In short, anti-Semitism is much of a threat to non-Jews as the Jewish community. And it is the primary narrative that drives the white nationalist movement today. We must confront anti-Semitism. The second myth that we often use to disempower ourselves is the belief that the white nationalist movement is made up of individuals who are uneducated or poor or alienated from society. That is simply not true. The truth is, is that if there are many working poor people, if there are many folks who are, haven't had the opportunity to go to college, if there are folks who are alienated, who are attracted to the white nationalist movement, that is because that is who is largely inside of our society. James Aho, a professor at the University of Idaho, in his seminal study of the white nationalist movement, the politics of righteousness, Christian patriotism in Idaho, did an incredible study that highlighted some things we should all understand. The white nationalist movement in Idaho had a higher level of income than the general population of Idaho as a whole. It had a higher level of education than the general population of Idaho as a whole and was more politically active. What does this tell us? This tells us simply that we have to understand that we are in a moment when we are dealing with a social movement, a highly evolved social movement that includes working class folks, but also those of different class levels, some who are highly educated, that this white nationalist social movement seeking to overthrow American democracy has its think tanks, its foundations, its organizers, and its new constituency. In challenging this movement, we cannot assert our own prejudices, our own myths. It is a movement that fundamentally seeks to overthrow the United States of America, not take us back to the myths of gone with the wind. It sees white supremacy as a failed program. It no longer seeks to exploit communities of color, but to rid communities of color and Jews through a program of ethnic cleansing. We have to understand that in this moment, the white nationalist movement is building a constituency and we must address that constituency. We must compete for its base and provide an alternative mission. If the first two myths are around how white nationalism is driven through the racism of anti-Semitism, its configuration much more complex than we give credit. It is this third point that I want to leave you with that is critically important. About four years ago, there was a large alt-right demonstration here in Portland. There was an alt-right activist who was uh, trying to catch his breath in the confrontation. And he was being interviewed by a citizen journalist who was screaming at him, demanding that this alt-right white nationalist activist explain why he was here in Portland. Didn't he know the city of Portland didn't want him? Didn't he know the mayor of Portland, Oregon, didn't want him? That no one wanted him in this community. Why was he here? What this white nationalist activist said in response should haunt us all. He said simply, I've heard we're not wanted here, but Portland is one of the cities in America with a shrinking black population by both percentage and whole number. You can say you don't want us here, he went on, but you all are actually doing something we could never get away with. You are literally disappearing the black population of Portland, Oregon. And here lies my final point. The truth of the matter is, 
It's white nationalists and their broader alt-right coalition. Don't bring racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia to our communities. They simply organize the bigotry that already exists. If we seek to take back this country from the political violence and chaos of white nationalist nihilism, we too have to face a truth. We have to be brave enough to pick up the mirror. This moment is not merely about managing threats, but about doubling down on the vision of what we mean when we say in America for all. We have to practice that vision each and every day. We have to give our communities and societies the opportunity to practice what it means to be an American. This is what Angela and Francella do each and every day. Expanding democracy, centering people each and every day. This is what the Reverend Dr. Everett C. Parker did with his life, committing to opening up space so that all of us can be seen and our stories heard. I want to be clear, what's happening right now is frightening. But we are not immobilized in this moment. Don't believe the hype. Whether it is digital platforms, we should understand that companies can do something if they choose to. It is not out of their control. And at the community level, if we are still facing insurrections in our community, we too can do something. We merely need to follow the example of Angela and Francella, who took the courageous step forward, who dared to dream. When I was a kid, we used to play a game, and it was called If I Were. If I Were were merely us sitting out in front of the lawn. And one at a time, we would come up with something. Like, if I found myself in a zoo and a lion got loose, here's what I would do. We'd argue about what we would do and how we would get out of it. Or if I was in a car and the brakes went out, here's what I would do. But each and every summer, one question always came up. If I were in the midst of the 1960s civil rights movement, here is what I would do. Whoa, would we argue. We had strong opinions as kids about what we would or wouldn't put up with. We didn't understand the choiceless choices of our parents and grandparents who grew up under white supremacy as a solid, unchallenged lens. We had no way of understanding the choices they had to make each and every day. So we were full of bravado. You may have had your own if I were moments, either alone or in conversation. What would we have done in the midst of the 1960s civil rights movement? Well, I'm here to tell you today, you no longer have to wonder. Whatever it is you would have done in the 1960s civil rights movement is exactly what you will do at the end of this lecture. You should understand that the choices before you are both moral and historic. You cannot be neutral in this moment. You must either pick the side of inclusion or exclusion. I leave you with this. Understand that you can make a difference. We watch the work of media justice each and every day. Double down in this moment. There is no reason to be hoarding your energy and resources for a longer arc. This is the point in history where we have the privilege to launch a 21st century civil rights movement. One that speaks to the challenges of today. One built through 75 years of sacrifice by those who came before us. One that leads a legacy for the generations that follow. This is our United States. 
if we choose it to be. One free from fear and bigotry. We merely have to choose it. It's your time to choose. Make it count. History will judge you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. I was really looking forward to your remarks, and it was with good reason. We are all gratified to hear your insights today. My name is Shante Jones, and I am the Director of Public Engagement and Digital Presence for the United Church of Christ. I want to thank everyone for coming to this year's Parker Lecture. I have the pleasure of bringing a little bit of the United Church of Christ to all of you. This summer, we held our Biennial General Synod for the first time ever online. As you may know, this is the meeting by which our denomination, which believes very much in accountability and transparent governance, comes together to plan our next two years. We make statements of public witness and worship together. I am so honored to share with you one of the most beautiful musical performances that we enjoyed together this summer. Please join with me as we listen to Mia Michelle McLean singing, I'm Surrounded, her original song. In it, she recognizes the women from her family, from history, standing beside her. Show up with me. 
can stand there at my side so I can stand Wow. What an event. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you spending a little piece of your day with us. Thank you again to Mia for her gorgeous music and thank you to our honorees. Eric, your words today were stirring and inspirational. Congratulations again on being named the first US laureate for the Civic Courage Prize. And to everyone who joined us today, please don't forget if you haven't made a donation yet, it is not too late to do so. Thank you again for joining us.